Today's topic is on attention, memory, and word finding. And I was asking for how many people here find that they're having issues with any of those. Hands up. Okay, so hopefully we'll give you some information today, give you a little bit more information that perhaps will be helpful to you. So the, how we're going to work the session today is I'm going to give you a little bit of information. Um, I'll have to give you a little bit of background, a little bit of theory, but a lot of what we're going to do is talking about some of the issues you're having and hopefully um, identify some strategies that will be helpful to you. So just to start the, the, the discussion on attention, um, there are many different types of attention. So um, I think it's important to kind of understand that um, because it, it will help to uh, give you a little bit of an insight if you're having difficulties with attention, why and, and perhaps where that, uh, that challenge is. So we, we break it down in terms of um, the five different areas, focused being the most basic type of attention. And uh, when we think of that, it's, it's just the ability to be aware and respond to stimuli. And we see that, you know, in young children when they're first, even infants, when they're first learning, you see that they'll hear a sound and they'll localize. So they're aware and they're responding, but it's, it's pretty much a, a very basic uh, type of a response. And um, so if you look at this here, you will just see that you're just kind of focused on the screen and you're seeing some numbers just kind of changing. So the next um, sort of level of attention that we sort of in the hierarchy is what we call sustained attention. And that's our ability to focus or maintain attention over time uh, while we're doing some sort of an activity. And this really calls to being vigilant. You need to really be kind of um, focused on something. And an example of that would be um, something like this. If I were to ask you to um, follow the screen and tap your hand every time you see the number four. Okay, so now you're seeing that, oops, I'm just going to close this off. So you're seeing in that case that you're needing to sustain your attention to the numbers, but you're having to focus and, and sustain it to looking at something specific. Mm -hmm. So you're having to be kind of vigilant and look for that. Um, an example of, of something at a complex level would be listening to a conversation um, and responding to when somebody asks you a question. So that's kind of a, a, a higher level of attention. Then we get into what we call selective attention, and that's, this is, again, moving up the, the hierarchy. This is the ability to ignore visual and auditory distractions while you're focusing on a task. Anybody here having difficulties with that? Okay, okay. Um, so an example of this might be you're talking to a friend at the mall, and there's a lot of noise going on around you. You might be visually distracted by people walking by, um, preparing a meal, well, there's you know people going uh, moving around, so you're being very distracted. So I have a little task here that I'd like to try if I can get it to work. So you're just gonna follow the instructions. This is a test of selective attention. Count how many times the players wear it white. How many passes did you count? How many passes? The correct answer is 15 passes. Okay. But did you see the gorilla? Who here saw the gorilla? Okay. Some of you missed that? So you were really focused on those passes, right? And you were able to ignore some of that other piece. Anybody seen this video before? Yeah. OK. 
Okay, so again, that's the ability to ignore the visual and the auditory distractions while focusing on um, a task. Uh, the next level, and again, we're getting into higher levels of attention now. This is what we call alternating attention. So this is the ability to move between two different tasks. Um, you really need to be flexible here and be able to, to know where you kind of left off so that when you come back, you can pick up. So an example of that might be you're doing an activity, you're reading a book, and then you're being interrupted. You come back, um, and you need to know where you left off to pick up. Or you might be um, answering, or you might be talking to somebody, the phone rings, you pick it up, and then being able to go back and, and uh, find out where you left off in the conversation. So again, more challenging. Is anybody here experiencing difficulties with that type of attention? Okay. So again, that can be, it can be very challenging, and it, it is a higher level skill. And then finally, we get into what we call multitasking, divided attention. I'm seeing some head shakes here already. Yeah, this is, this is, this is very challenging. So this is the ability to respond and do two or more tasks at once. Um, and an example of that would be driving the car. So you think about what you're doing when you're driving a car. You've got m multiple things going on. You're doing motor tasks. You're doing um, cognitive. You're visually scanning your environment. You're doing multiple things. So it's very, very challenging. So those are the different types of attention. And I don't know, it, it, people are often sort of surprised. They just, they don't really think of it. They just think of attention. But it's really, and, and, and individuals can have difficulties in more than one of these areas and it, it although I've described it as a hierarchy it can be um, attention for different kinds of material so people could have difficulty much more with visual attention um, than with auditory and and so on and so forth so it's really trying to, to to figure out where the difficulties are for you to be able to identify strategies so this is just a for fun activity here supposed to be moving to the next screen. There we go. So did you count three or four? Anybody? Four. Okay. Why is this acting up on me here? Sorry. The answer is six. We tend to miss these little, um, the little words that are between Okay, we go for more of the content words. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about memory now. So um, when you talk, we talk about memory, there's a lot of different terms that we, you'll hear. Um, so try to break it down and in, in, in talk about it in the context of a couple of different ways. But we talk about the stages of memory, sort of like how do we get information in and remember it. And so the very beginning stage really is attention, because if you can't focus on something, then it's not going to move into you know, you're not going to have an opportunity to move it into memory. Um, so we've been talking a little bit about attention. And then we talk about this encoding. So we talk about how we analyze material um, so that it, we can then make sense of it and it gets transferred into, um, into a storage area of our brain. So we, we analyze the material, we maybe break it down, we might think about it in terms of information we already knew or um, how it relates to other experiences in our life. And then we look at the storage. So it gets transferred then into storage, an area in our brain where we store information. And then it, we, ret we retrieve that information later. So when you think about it, there's a lot of steps involved in memory. And it's no wonder that we run into problems, OK? Because you can run into challenges at any one of these stages that can result in, in a problem with, with remembering, OK? When we, talk about, uh, when we talk about memory, too, we tend to talk about short-term and long-term memory. Is that sounding familiar to you? Who here has difficulties with the short-term memory? 
Okay. Yeah. Anybody here having difficulty with long-term memory? Okay. Okay. It's not as common um, after brain injury. The, the short-term memory tends to be um, the area that people identify difficulty. Um, and that's, um, uh, so the short-term memory is more of those kind of, you know, what did I do yesterday? What did I eat for dinner? A conversation you had. The long-term memory tends to be more of that stuff from a long time ago, like where you went to school, and who were your friends in grade school, and, and some of those longer-term memory. Um, so we tend to hear those terms described as well, short-term and long-term memory. So just so you have a little bit of an idea. Um, and when we talk about short-term memory, we, we often talk about a capacity that we have to remember. So we sort of have a, um, an amount that we can remember. And, you know, the research shows that it's, it's sort of at that 7 plus or minus 2 um, units of information. When you think about it, that's kind of about the length of our phone numbers, right? So the ability to remember information kind of beyond that becomes more of a challenge. That's kind of our span for short-term memory capacity. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about, so we, I think when I asked if people were having short-term memory problems or memory problems in general, I think I saw a lot of nods that this is a pretty common, common issue for people. Okay, all right. So we talk about retrieval errors. Um, so tell me if this is something that you experience. You, it's kind of like on the tip of your tongue. Your something is there and you just can't quite get at it, but you sort of know that you have some recollection of it. Um, and then somebody might say something and then it triggers that memory. Does that, does that happen to people? Yeah, okay. So that's a retrieval problem. It's in there, it's just you're having trouble accessing it, okay? So you have somehow stored it in that in that sequence of stages, you've stored that in there, but it's, there's a problem with retrieving it. And that varies, th that differs from when we talk about storage problems. And storage problems are things didn't get stored properly, maybe they didn't get stored in the right place, or maybe they didn't get stored at all because there was something that kind of interfered with it. And we'll talk a little bit more because that's where attention becomes a factor um, and not being able to store information properly. Um, who here has heard of what we call prospective memory? Is that term familiar at all to anybody? Okay, that's probably one of the most challenging types of memory, and that's kind of remembering in the future, remembering to remember. Let's remember. talk a little bit about the difference between attention and memory. So, can anybody describe what the difference is? So, I'll give you an example. Okay, we have Johnny's sitting in the classroom and he's listening to the teacher teach um, the math class. But he's really not listening. He's actually thinking about what he's going to do when he gets out of school. He's going to go, who he's going to play with, what he's going to do. So when he gets home to do his homework that night, how many of you think he's going to be able to do his homework? Think he'll have trouble? Yeah. Do you think it's a memory problem there? No. It never actually got in there, right? Because he was really preoccupied and distracted with his own thoughts, okay? Nothing maybe going around, but his own thoughts, he was preoccupied. And that happens to all of us. I mean, it all, it happens to everybody. But I think the difference is thinking about how, how frequently maybe it happens now compared to before, before your injury, right? So there's an example of, of attention. So memory might be where Susan is in the classroom and she's listening really, really hard to the teacher go over the math exercise. And she, she's, she thinks she's got it and then she goes home and she's having trouble doing her homework. And so her mom's helping her and maybe helping her by you know, giving her some cues to help her and then she eventually it starts to come back. So that would be an example of a memory problem which is a re she, she's having trouble retrieving that information but once it's sort of somebody what we call primes her or starts to give her a little bit of cues then she gets that. That doesn't always happen because if it didn't get stored properly but the difference is that it, it, it actually got into it got in there but it's just it's she's having some problem accessing that information. So that just kind of gives you a really general um, idea about the difference between attention and memory. Many times 
individuals have both. Okay, so it's not usually a either or. It's often there may be both occurring. So it's important to know that. But some individuals I see, um, and we go through, you know, um, a very thorough assessment and identify uh, the attention and, and the memory um, um, skills and abilities, and we determine w which area is the is the focus because it's important then to work on that area, um, and then the other area may just it, it may just kind of you know work through. So it is very important to identify that early on. We're going to talk a little bit about some specific examples, yeah. right? And we'll talk a little bit about that um, because could that actually be an attention problem? If you were not, when you're actually doing something, and we do this a lot, I know I do at times, I'm busy focused on things that are going in my head and I've actually done something and not even realized I've done it because I've been so focused. So it could be attention, it could be memory. Um, and in this case, there's different strategies regardless that would be helpful. There may be some uh, uh, strategies to zero in on if it's attention. But regardless, there's some specific examples of, of what you might do, if it's, especially if it's a reoccurring is it always, you know, do you, is it phone, keys, things that are constantly being misplaced? Those are relatively simple fixes if we, if we look at trying to develop a strategy, like keeping it the same spot, right? Key hook, things like that. Um, and sometimes what I, what I have people do is keep a log um, and track their examples of their memory difficulties over a week, and then we look at those reoccurring things, the things that seem to keep happening. Sometimes there can be like a quick fix um, and just alleviate frustration too because we spend a lot of energy looking for misplaced things. You know, all of these things we talk about, there is that range of what's normal. I mean, we, we've all had difficulties thinking of people's names, thinking of the word, misplacing things. But I guess it's kind of looking back and reflecting on um, how different is it now from before. You know, is this, is this much more of a problem? And, and I guess sometimes, too, not always blaming it on the brain injury. Not always, oh, there's my brain injury again, you know. Sometimes we do, ha we do have a tendency to do that. And that, that's not really helpful either. So we have to kind of try to keep that in perspective as well, that some of these things do range in the normal range. Anything else? Misplacing items, uh, names sort of forget almost what you're doing, right? And again, I question, is that memory, is that attention? Are you focused on something else while you're trying to do that task? And so then it's like, oh, you lose, you know, so it's, it's again trying to sort out what is the root of the problem. So we just talked about this. So attention and memory functions can be affected by fatigue, Okay, so huge. And you all have been through uh, triage, I believe, and so have had, you know, opportunities to talk to them and uh, are, I guess probably know what your, what your symptoms are. Okay, so your symptoms play a huge role in, in, um, in memory and other cognitive functions. So fatigue, your emotions, your ability to uh, manage your emotions, um, when we become frustrated, angry, more emotional, it's harder for us to, um, to function, to think of what we want to say, the words don't come as readily, all of those things. Um, the environment, we've talked about the environment and how um, the busyness can be overwhelming and impact, okay? Um, and that can be overstimulation of noise, light here. Anybody here have uh, problems with, with sensitivity to light? Right, okay. And noise? Yeah, so all of those things, right, can affect your ability to focus and to attend and to remember. So really important. And then the social and psychological. So if you're going through um, issues related to um, your, your brain injury, you know, um, depression, anxiety, those, all of those things can have a huge impact as well. So it's really important to know that. Um, and. Uh, it's not just a matter of kind of sort of separating memory and just saying, okay, this is, this is a problem and I'm going to work on it because a lot of these factors um, interplay. And so sometimes by resolving some of these, well, definitely by resolving some of these other symptoms, they can have a huge um, impact on, on your ability.
has anybody ever done memory and attention drills? Trying to kind of increase your capacity to remember more? You've seen exercises or you've seen advertisements for increasing your brain power? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's lumosity, so there's those different cognitive tasks. Um, so there's, there's memory and attention practice drills. And basically, um, what the focus on, is on um, in treatment when we're working on things like that, it's to actually improve your brain's ability to remember. So um, we use the term neuroplasticity. So really it's about, there's two ways that we kind of go about it, but it's really primarily learning new ways to do old things. Now there is research out there that sort of, sort of speaks to the, the drills, that there's um, particularly memory drills, there's question about whether there's actually carryover to your ability to remember. So learning um, how to, you know, retain longer um, sequences of numbers. How does that actually help you remember, you know, your grocery list or remember things like that? Um, so there is some there is some research that supports it, and some that's 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 not so great. We find that, that that there tends to be a little bit more support for doing attention drills that tend to carry over. Um, but we do do, for some individuals, it is effective. And working on some of those activities like the lumosity and posit science, there's, there's a ton of those brain games that you can, they're, they're really more what we talk about as cognitive stimulation. But um, there is some evidence to show that they do help, okay? Um, but we tend to focus quite a bit on strategies, okay? Um, and I'll just give you a bit of an analogy to explain the difference between these and, and to help you in terms of the context of, of memory and attention training. When somebody breaks their leg, they um, maybe are in a wheelchair initially because they can't walk. So that would be a strategy to help them get around. Okay, And so as they get a little bit better, they start to put a little bit of weight on, um, they can bear weight and they, they have crutches. Again, the crutches are a strategy to help them get around. But then they might start going to physio and the physiotherapist might, doing, might start doing some exercises to increase the strength in their, their muscles that have uh, been affected from the break. So that would be those practice drills, sort of more Lear, learn, having the muscles relearn how to do things again. But all the time they're using the strategies like the crutches to get around. Okay, so then they might eventually move to the point where they don't need to use anything except for long distance, maybe a cane. So that might be a strategy that they would use, um, you know, for an indefinite period of time to help them walk on long walks. Okay, so that's a strategy. But they continue to go to physio until they build up that strength. So those are the so those again are those practice drills. So we do the same thing with memory and attention. We work on exercises to improve the brain um, and the ability to remember, but we employ strategies all the while. And a lot of these strategies are common sense things, things that anybody could use and could benefit from. So some of the strategies for attention would be things like, um, and it was mentioned earlier, altering your environment, looking at the environment, making sure that you account for things like um, having your conversations in a quiet location where there's not a lot of background noise, turning off the TV if you need to have an important conversation, um, or if you're trying to read and you can't retain information, make sure it's quiet. So those are some environmental strategies that you can pretty easily put in place that will help you focus. Now, it doesn't always work. If you're out uh, in a restaurant, you can't control the environment. Uh, if, or if you're out in the, in the mall, you can't always control those things. Um, but when possible, it's really helpful to do that. Um, and it's really important to educate others about that piece. So making sure that your family and your friends are aware that you know th these are huge issues for me. Um, and maybe not going out to a noisy restaurant um, as a first step, but maybe going to a quiet friend's house and just having a quiet, calm, have a quiet evening and a cup of tea might be the route to go. Um, has anybody find, ha, 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 has anybody found that that's a strategy that's been helpful to just try to control their environment a little bit? Yeah. How about earplugs? Anybody use earplugs? Sunglasses? Okay. Now, our audiologists would 
have some things to say about the earplugs. Um, earplugs are okay if they're an absolute, this is a, like I can't function without, but prolonged use of earplugs really delays, um, it just kind of postpones, um, it, it doesn't help you to move into those situations where you can tolerate. So that's where uh, working to try to build up those filters or to tolerate, to to tolerate some of those factors um, is important and that's where working with your therapist can help you to do that. Um, so gradually working towards increase that. That's that kind of process training with the brain. Getting the brain to relearn how to use the filters that used to work effectively. Okay. Um, consistency and routine in your schedule really important. So you know that you know if you have a big evening out um, and you want to be really focused and attentive and be able to carry on conversations with friends, you don't plan a lot of stuff before. So you talked a lot about that, I think, last week with Becky. And you talked about pacing points, and I think, correct? Yeah. So being able to pace out so that you don't run out of steam. And because when you're fatigued, your attention's not going to be as effective. So really planning in your schedule when you're going to have things happen so that you have success. Mindfulness. Does anybody know? Did Becky talk about mindfulness last week? About mm, being mindful? There's a... There's a lot of uh, literature that supports uh, mindfulness meditation. Um, I'm not going to talk about that right now, but it, it really brings down to being in the moment, being kind of focused on what you're doing right now, being mindful. So that example that about misplacing your phone, being really focused when you're put, when you come in the door and putting it down and really being thinking about what it is you're doing with the phone at the moment and trying not to think about... Um, oh, I gotta get onto Facebook and I've got, you know, thinking about other things, really focusing on what you're doing at the moment um, is, has shown to be very effective to help. So we talk about external strategies and internal strategies. So you're all using external strategies because most of you mentioned that you've got a phone or some sort of a planner. So these are things that you carry around with you to help you remember. In our day and age, I mean, there's more and more of these uh, technology and um, um, all kinds of aids and planners that are out there because our, our world seems to be getting busier and busier and we're, we're having to keep track of so many things. So, I mean, just for everybody, I think it's a good habit. I know my kids in, like, elementary school, they were given planners, which was not heard of when I was in school, but I mean, it's just, it speaks to the busyness in our lives now. So, um, you know, these strategies and, and these devices are out there, um, but for some of you that didn't have to use them before, you may kind of think, well, it's just a reminder now of what I have to do, right? So you have to try to not think of it from that perspective and think about what it can do for you. Um, but certainly, um, there's just a wealth of information out there. Um, and I sometimes get questions about, well, if I use those, is that going to make my brain weaker? Um, and that's not really the case because your brain is working all the time. And there's lots of other things that you have to use your, your memory for that you can't use your planner or your phone. Um, so I wouldn't worry about it from that. I, I, I tend to just, you know, try to think of it. This is kind of like um, gives me permission to let it go out of my brain if I've got it in my phone or I've got it down. Now, those devices are only as good as if you use them properly. So if you put your information in there and then you don't ever look at it, it's not going to help you. So you have to get into a real routine of using your phone and using your planner and getting into a system of checking it and updating it. But it can be very effective and it can just give you a bit of permission to let go and leave that brain space for other things that you can't write down. So let's talk a little bit about internal strategies. So these are things that are up here. So harder to learn, but can be more effective because you don't have to rely on something that's external that you have to carry around with you. So you probably don't even um, realize that you use a lot of these strategies. So we use chunking for phone numbers a lot. Like how many of us remember seven numbers when we're remembering? Do, do most people think of like the three-digit area code as, as like a, a chunk. 
um, it used to be when before before we got into all of these new area codes, there used to be just a few, right? So I would just kind of like I wouldn't even remember that. I wouldn't even focus on that because I knew it was five one nine or whatever. But now there's with cell phones, there's lots of them. So but chunking, and so that that first three digits actually becomes a chunk, and then you just have to remember the the four. And then again, instead of remembering, you know, um, two zero one three, it's 2013 or so so you remember it as a as a bigger chunk and will help you um, but that's a perfect example of chunking and you probably all use that not realizing it but using those things for other things as well other um, pieces of information numbers tend to be really easy to chunk um, but other things as well you can actually chunk um, like chunking um, a grocery list uh, there's other ways to remember grocery list too but you could chunk you know, um, things into, um, you know, kind of thinking about your list and chunking the four things together or grouping them um, into a, a common category. What about visual imagery? Does, do people know what that means? Visual, visual imagery can be a very strong strategy. Um, conjuring up something that attaches meaning to you. Um, some people use visual imagery for um, uh, remembering people's names. Um, my coworker uses this example when she, uh, when she does the, the session on, um, her name is Penny. So she asks people to think about visualizing her with this huge crown that has this huge copper penny on top, which won't be around with us too much longer with pennies going out of commission. Um, and then her walking through the door and banging her head on the, she hits her head on the, the, uh, the top of the frame and, and falls down. Um, and so then she asks people when they come back next time, I'm going to ask you, you know, what my name and what do you, what do you associate? So sometimes it's getting a really funny visual image to connect with it that can help you. Um, but it's really um, uh, trying to just pull up anything that's going to connect for you. Um, while we're on the topic, I'm going to jump off just with the topic of your example for Walmart. Um, the visual image is great. Um, has anybody thought of using their cell phone to help them do that? That's kind of a visual image that's actually captured, right? So actually taking a picture of that. So there's an example of a captured visual image, right? A digital image that can actually help you. And why not? I mean, I say, we have our technology, let's, let's use it. And people don't think about sometimes how we can use these things in novel ways. Um, so that's visual imagery. So association, uh, it's kind of a, a related, but it may be more any kind of um, an association that you can make to connect something together. So for example, say you're trying to remember somebody's name. So if you can associate it with somebody that you know that has the same name, then you might, that might help to form a connection. You might have to rehearse that, you, you know, um, kind of repeat that over in your mind. Um, but that might be an example. And, um, and while we talk about rehearsing, they, they, there is evidence to show that um, after a brain injury, um, if we used rehearsal before to help us remember or learn new information, we might have to if we had to rehearse something maybe three or four times before, we might have to rehearse it 10 or 15 times. So that's just something. Well, I'm, not, I'm just giving you an example. I'm not, saying, I'm not saying that everybody's different, but that you may need to rehearse something a lot more to get it to, to memory. Whereas before, you might have only had to do it once or twice, and it was there. How, how, how many people were, used to be really good at phone numbers, and now they have more difficulty. I never, I never was good at phone numbers. I need to rehearse a lot. So back to the association, if you can link things um, in a way that will help you associate, link, and, and linking things to something that you already have in your memory. Okay, you know, oh, now I remember that name because it's the same as, and you go through, it's, it's the same as, as my cousin, that type of thing. The last one is acronyms. Um, so we talk about acronyms or mnemonics. There's word mnemonics um, and uh, there's rhyme mnemonics. So these are things, the acronyms are things that um, basically help us, little tricks. So um, how many people knew what 
every good boy deserves fudge mint. Did everybody have that? Okay. It was, yeah, yeah. So it was, um, every good boy deserves fudge. Okay. So it's just a little saying that you might say to help you remember the saying, right? Um, what about uh, 30 days has September, April, June, and November? Those little kind of rhyme mnemonics to help you. So again, they're harder to learn, but they tend to stick with you forever and ever, um, and they can be helpful. So what I'm going to do now is I am going to ask you to write down as many of those items that you can on your sheet. And we were to organize them. How could we organize them? Anybody want to take a stab? Yeah, sure. Alphabet. alphabet? Okay. So you could go through and uh, put them in the alphabet. All right, well, we're going to go through and do the alphabet is, is good. Let's go through and do the by category since we had a couple of people do that. So um, if we were to start with, oh, shoot, sorry, I have to do this um, first. I forgot. There we go. Okay. So let's, um, let's put our food up here. What else goes over here then? The apples. The apples. Does anybody want to come up and do this, by the way? This is kind of fun with the smart board. Does anybody want to come play? No? Okay. Um, <laughs> just thought. Um, all right. So we want the egg. Okay. What else did we say? The cheese has got to go over here. Okay. And, okay, so let's get a couple of these things. The Coke, okay. Oh, shoot. You're not behaving. There we go. Okay, I'm gonna move this down here. Okay, so is there anything else that we wanna put with the food? Let's, let's start another category then. Okay, what else do we wanna have? What's our next category? Well, we could do that. Frog's legs. All right. Okay. So now what else do we have? Transportation. Transportation. Okay. So let's, um, we're going to have a bus here. What else goes here? Rocket? Okay. So we'll put the transport and the space shuttle. Okay. And the hot air balloon. Okay, perfect. Okay. What else? What do we want to do next? Music? Music? Okay. So we have a drum. What else? Treble clef. Treble clef? Okay. Anything else? Guitar. Guitar? Okay. Is that it? Okay, what else? Games? Okay, what have we got left? We've got this. So what else could we do? So the only problem with this is that I didn't have enough time to make an association, so I, I forgot all the office supplies. Like, I didn't get one of them. Okay, so, but that is a category? Right, so office supplies, we could do this and this. People probably don't know what that. <laughs> Some of us do. <laughs> okay. And then what is the last one? What would we say for that category? Numbers. Numbers, okay. Oh, and by the way, this is kind of cool. See? So that just, that's just in there, just for fun. Oops. Okay. So there we go. So how many categories do we have? We have one, two, three, four, five. So we have food, musical instruments, office supplies, numbers, and transportation. Okay, overall, did you do better than last time? Yeah, okay. Good, because if you didn't, then the strategy didn't work. <laughs> the idea was that it did help. So, um, so you can see how grouping information, chunking it, or putting into more meaningful um, combinations can help you. So we had a couple things there. We had categories, 
We also had even, if we go back, we had location too, so locating things. Um, knowing how many items there were in total might help to be a cue to remind you and knowing how many categories there were and how many items maybe in each category. So there's different things you could have been, been doing even within the groupings of the categories to help you. How many remembered this because of it turning? Did anybody? Did that help? Yeah? For some people, just the interactiveness of it because it was different, that might have stood out for people. So. Um, Anyway, so this is just an example to show you that you can, your memory, you can, use, you can use strategies to help you. And it's just a matter when you're approaching things to think about that. Okay. Any questions? All right. Let's go to, um, we're going to talk about word finding now. Anybody here having problems with their words, thinking of the words they want to say? Okay. Yep. And... Here's an example. So you're t talking and you suddenly draw a blank. You know what you want to say, and it's just you just can't kind of think of the word. Um, okay, pretty common. Um, we talked about this a little bit earlier. We talked about how fatigue, how our symptoms can have that Im uh, impact, um, how attention can enter into the picture. So if we're okay on a one-to-one, -one, but as soon as we put ourselves in a mix of a lot of people and trying to focus, then we lose the train of thought or we can't think of the words. Okay, um, and so it's that, it's that tip of the tongue phenomena. I know what I want to say, it's just I can't quite get it out. Uh, really, really pretty common. And again, we talk about, okay, this, did this not happen to you before? Yes, it happens to all of us. But it's kind of looking at the frequency with which it happens now and how much of an impact it has. Um, so the real technical term for word finding is anomia. And it's just the inability to come up with the names of objects, places, people. Um, and again, to some degree it happens to all of us, but you may be finding this as more of an issue now. And it may be interrelated. Although I've been talking about all these things today, like attention and memory, they're all interconnected. Okay? They all interrelate. And, and, and um, one, you know, you, you, you can't really, we talk about them separately, but they all they all interrelate and, and it's very uh, important to really understand that. Um, so what are some of the characteristics? So for some of you, you may have trouble find, you know, thinking of the names of people, places and things. And you may not have been, that might not have been a strong um, area for you before, but now it's even more of a problem. Um, sometimes there's just a hesitancy. It's like you just need a little bit more time to think things through. And, and when you think about it, um, writing is just a, like writing and, and speaking are both expressive forms of communication. What people find is they may have more challenge with their expressive speaking ability because it's more spontaneous, like it's more fast paced in conversation where you're, whereas when you're sitting and writing, you usually don't have that same, quite that same pressure. You might, it depends on the situation if you're writing an essay for a test or something, but often you have more time to compose um, and, and think about it when you're, you know, sending an email or something like that than when you're having a conversation and you've got to really think on the fly. Um, so again, again, this, 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 uh, the degree of this problem can vary from individual to individual and, and it, it, you may have experienced this before. We all experience uh, word finding difficulties in different situations when we're under pressure, when we're, when we're more emotional, you know, thinking about getting up and giving that presentation and thinking of everything you want to say fluently and you know, you're a little bit nervous and things like that, it can be more challenging for any of us. Um, so it's really important, I think, to remember that it's really all about getting that message in and out. Okay? And sometimes what happens is, and I work with individuals that they get so hung up on getting stuck on that word that they get distracted by it. It almost like they're, they're going to get that word and by the time they get the word, the conversation is moved on and everybody's talking about something else and then they, they've lost the focus because they're, they've been distracted by their own thoughts. And so we really try to encourage to try to just move forward with it and not get sort of too hung up with it because it's really about having an, an effective conversation or communication with somebody, right? <clears throat> and you know, in, in reality, we're probably a lot more aware of it than the other people are. And so a better strategy is to just try to move forward 
you know, uh, maybe describe what it is that, you, that you're looking for. Um, ask the person for help if you're okay with that. So to talk a little bit about uh, things that, uh, different strategies, so it might be um, things like um, being able to describe the words. So getting, you know, the, our English language has lots of um, words that we can substitute. Um, not things like names and things like that, but if we're stuck on a word, trying to come up with another word that you can use instead of, um, or maybe just describing it. So, you know, I'm trying to think about, um, say, the milk, you know, something you drink that's white, it comes from cows, things like that. So the whole idea is just being able to, to um, try to, to come up with a word that will. Again, this really is dependent on the situation and what the purpose is. So, I mean, if this is something that's very important to you and you want to be able to focus on, I think maybe that's, that's what we're speaking about. You really want to focus on that issue and that, that aspect of the, of the communication, then that's, um, then that's that's, that's that's perfectly fine too. I think it's 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 though in the the moment being able to um, be able to have a successful conversation and not get uh, to distracted to the point where you lose the focus of the conversation entirely. Um, pointing gestures, pantomime, are just other kind of examples of things you could use when when in the moment you're you're kind of really stuck on the word that you're trying to think of. Um, so this, you know, speaking about what others can, can do to help, and this is really, I think, it talks a little bit about what you're saying, really having a clear understanding with, with um, your, um, uh, your loved one or your family member who, who is going through this and understanding how they would like to deal with it. Some, some individuals would prefer that they, they want to get the word, so that's fine. Others may be okay with um, some assistance and somebody giving them a cue. Uh, or maybe giving them the word because at that particular moment really what they do they want to do is get that that story out and so getting hung up on that one word so it's really important to have that um, um, clarify what assistance you can provide to your loved one um, and what it is that they would like to help to support them in, um, in moving through uh, the challenge of the word finding um, so I just brought a, a, a few little um, highlights of some websites that um, some of you may already know about some of these. But again, I think a lot of you probably know about Lumosity. These are just a few of the websites that we have found kind of um, interesting for working on building vocabulary and uh, word finding. I'm not going to say that this is like recommended therapy for word finding, they're just activities you could do. This one in particular I really like. Uh, has anybody heard about freerice.com? So it's kind of a neat, um, it's kind of a neat feel-good uh, <clears throat> activity. So um, we've done research and it, and it, and it is legit. Uh, but basically what you do is you have different levels. It goes up to level 60. And um, I would tell you, don't go to level 60. It's really challenging. Um, start, start at a level, like start at level one or start wherever. And um, basically what you do is you go through and teacher means the same as, anybody give me the answer? Instructor, okay. So, <clears throat> it should load here, hopefully. Hmm, it's being difficult. Oh, so there we go. We get some rice in a bowl. Okay, so next one, basic means the same as... So we get more rice in the bowl. So as we go through, um, you can see <clears throat> that we're collecting rice, and this is actually going to donate to Feed the Poor. And you can, um, it's a free website, you can log on, you can track yourself and keep track of this, and then it gets into bags of rice and so on and so forth. What I suggest is that if you're working on this, that you work around 80% 
Um, if you're getting 95%, it's, that level's too easy. If you're getting 60%, it's too difficult. So we're somewhere around the 80% level. And again, it's not, um, it's really just a way to build vocabulary. It's a good cognitive thinking task. It kind of works on spelling and reading and a lot of those different things. And this would be, you know, example of using those, uh, substituting those words when you're stuck on a word and you want to think of another word to replace that. Um, there's a couple of others as well, and I think in the interest of time, I will not go on and show you those. But